At Collins Morgan, we offer friendly, regulated and ethical advice for anyone living in Scotland. Over the last six years, we have helped thousands of Scottish residents become debt-free. Our organisation always have your best interests at heart and our advisors are trained to help you in any situation with a range of solutions always available. If you're struggling with debts, act now and call one of our friendly advisors on 0141 218 4450. And we're on. Magic. James, the boy, how are we, mate? I'm good, James. Thanks very much. First and foremost, mate, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on the show. You sent us a book. Definitely, maybe, probably not. For Glasgow to go, boy for Cashmo, end up in the jail in India for four years fighting for your freedom. That's right. So how's things been? Um, things are good today, aye. Aye, things are good. Um, I'm, I look after myself a lot better than the day than I did um, back then. Mm -hmm. You sent us a book. I've read it over the last few days. Great book, right, really thanks, interesting, thanks. some mad stuff in it, so for the people watching we'll go right back to the start of your life, Probably. where you grew up, I know you grew up in Castlemock, but how did you end up getting um, involved in the stuff that you did? I kinda, when I was a wee boy we moved to South Africa, um, my dad was a plumber, and the kind of 70s were pretty crap, um, just just like the day financially for people, um, economically, and we moved to South Africa and we were there for a few years and I remember life being great. Um, sunshine and glass bottles of Coca-Cola and all that before they were actually here. Um, and I got up one morning and he was lying dying on the bathroom floor. Um, he died the next day. Two weeks later, my ma had his back in cast smoke again. And that was your dad? That was my dad, aye. Um, Brain hemorrhage? A cerebral hemorrhage, aye. Um, he was only 33, he was only a young guy, a fit young man, you no. Know? Um and having spoke to people, my man never, my ma didn't ever want to talk about it. Um, but having spoke to his brother as I got older, um, totally unexpected, you know, he was a fit guy, never missed a day at his work. Um, and I was always with him, that's my memory, you know, he, when he wasn't working, he was working doing homers and I was always there. And, and then life then was all swimming pools outside and... Um, Although as I got older, I realised South Africa wasn't a great place if you were only um, white back then. Mm. Um, but before we know it, we're back and staying with my granny again in Castmelt. And, um, and it had a big effect on me. What age were you when your dad died? Ten. So he's moved all there for a better life? Aye. Um, what happened was his sister had been... In, his sister went a few years previous. Um, and his two brothers went to New Zealand with their families. And my dad must have decided, I think for economic reasons, as opposed to South Africa being a better place than New Zealand, um, he took us there with his sister. Um, you know, and like I say, the, my, my memories of it were, were great, you know, going to school there, um, playing rugby and cricket, rather than football and a red ash part that ended up Coming back, back. <laughs> scraped and bruised, oh, slight like tackles in the red ash. Oh, as if he'd been shot in the backside. So when you came back, did oh, it clearly must have affected you, losing your dad, especially if it's unexpected, especially losing him in an instant where you're not expecting it, so you can't really prepare yourself. You can never really prepare yourself for a loss, James, but when you're as young as that, moving back to Castlemilk, when did you start getting involved in like, the drug scene and... Um, that didn't really happen until, so my life kind of progressed, I, I didn't, I wasn't into the glue sniffing or anything like that, no, um, you know, and other boys that I was hanging about with were, and, and I was always scared of it all, it was, there was something about it that didn't, I, I, I was never really into, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had my first drink when I was about 15, um, and it ended up a mess. When I'm 16, I start to hang about with the boys in the street and I'm drinking mere and getting arrested and, and then I'm dabbling in kind of acid and stuff like that. And then in 1980, probably 1982, um, me, and, me and my pal, me and two boys, but one who was my pal, a closer pal, we ended up trying smack for the first time. Well, it was the first time for me. As it transpires, it wasn't his first time. 
Um, and although I was working, I was an apprentice plumber. Um, I, I, I was using smack for about four months. Um, snorting it. Nobody was smoking smack at the time. I, I was, I was snorting it. What um, effects of snorting it? Um, pretty much the same as without the rush is. Is it as if you were injecting it or smoking it? You know what I mean. Um, but if you snort smite, you can overdose on it as well if you take too much of it. I've never Just, known anybody. To I will see see back and see if you speak to anybody for the eighties. You're for post, aren't you? Is that ah, your yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you speak to anybody for the eighties. Um, that was the progression. You know what I mean. It was nobody was smoking heroin at the time. People snorted it. See, I thought it was all just needles and smoking. No, no, um, no. The 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 snorting was a thing. Um, and at the time, I was, I, I'm glad there was no smoking at the time because I, I would maybe I get mad into it, you know what I mean? Um, but it came the time when, again, unknown to me, he'd already had his first hit. Um, and we were in my ma's, it was me and him and another boy, and, and it came to my turn, and I, and I just thought, I can't do that, no, no. and I didn't. Um, and I just got back to drinking and causing trouble and, and that sort of stuff. Um, the drinking get worse, the polis came into my life. And then when I was 19, I made my first geographical change and ran away to Jersey. Um, and I had two, two, two years in Jersey that were all right, you know what I mean? But it was just drinking me. Basically. Did you have contacts in Jersey? You go there? One, one, of my, one of my pals um, had cousins that stayed in Jersey. And um, we went there. But we went to Jersey, half of Glasgow was in Jersey because they were all running away for the same stuff. Half of Liverpool was in Jersey and there was quite a lot of Dublin in Jersey as well. Um, it was all right, but um, I I can uh, I missed my ma, no, and and by this point I'm every time I get drunk I think about my dad who's died when I was a wee boy as well, no, and I was a greeter I cried all the time when I was drunk for my ma or for my dad or mm. for, for sensitive, right? Oh, really, really touchy. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> no, I was really touchy. I know you speak about the book. You've been to go a few times. Aye. Well, what made you go to <clears throat> India for the first time? First time in the kind of I was part of the kind of late 80s, 90s ecstasy generation. Um, taking pills and going out clubbing and going to raves. And um, and it was all great, you know. And, and by this point, I'm selling drugs and um, getting involved in all, all sorts of stuff like that. But 1993, they they pulled the flats down where I, where I grew up and they gave everybody 20, no, 2,500 quid or something like that. And my brother was, um, he's like, I'm going to go over, going for the rave scene and all that. And, and we did. So I, I tagged along with him and his wife, um, my sister-in-law. And um, we went to go and had four weeks partying in the jungle. And um, it was great. It was magic. And the following year, we went back and done, I went back and done pretty much the same. Um, so I had the, the Goa thing. Um, and I'd been back and forward to Goa a few times before I actually got arrested. And that was just the start of it for you getting involved. You kind of away for it all. You kind of away for maybe the pain and the misery here, and then getting all the other things. Was about to escape for you to be all there, need to know you, oh, yeah, get involved in the I, drugs, and you're all there, and nobody does know you. You know what I mean? Until and for me, even through the the kind of 1993, 1994, 1995, because I was I went three years in a row. Um, I was still drinking, still getting into fights and all that, and people were like, oh, what's happening there? You know what I mean? But all I hear, and it's, it was all peace and love stuff. And um, What kind of drugs were you taking in India? Um, when I first went to India, I was I was just, we were taking ease. You no, know, we were taking on the pills. Um, and, but we were out every night, and if it wasn't every night, it was every other night, because it was, go a trance was massive, you know, through the kind of, kind of late 80s, 90s. Um, so there was big jungle raves We see the full moon parties that you see in Thailand they, they go on all the time but they don't anymore but um, so we were at the aim you know and it was just dancing and dancing myself skinny basically man and it was it was great I loved it all it was, it was an experience it was all experience and it was all good times for me but obviously the tables would have turned and for loving it you must have shit yourself when was it when you get caught with the polis was it two and a half kilo a hash 2.75 kilo um a harsh eye. Um, that all there is a, is a 10 stretch, and it? it's 10 years. 10 years for that all there eye. Up to 1,000 gram, you get seven years. Um, 1,000 gram up to a million gram, it's 10 years. So it doesn't matter whether it's one kilo or 1,000 kilo. It's it's 10 years you get. 
How so? What was it? How did that story begin? Then you were collect the hash. Um, were you selling it all there? Or were you just? I, I was. I was kind of selling stuff, and I was sending wee bits back, and I was um, people who couldn't get it. I was going and getting them basically. Um, so I got asked to go and get a bit. Um, I went and a, a boy that I'd been going and seen for long enough, who'd been in, I'd been introduced to him by another guy who I'd known for years. Um, and at the time, I was going between a Nigerian guy and an Indian guy. And I, there was something about the Nigerian guy I was near 100% sure about. And I kind of, I backed the Indian guy in the race and he was the guy who gave me the bolus in the end up, so. And that uh, was for two and a half kilo, over two and a half kilo. Right. So what was the experience then when you go to jail? Um, was that set up? Oh, absolutely, I At the time I thought he'd just stuck me in um, because it was obvious that, what happened was I'd went, I'd went to his house, I'd got the bag, I'd got 2.75 kilo in the bag. I thought it was three kilo. Um, t it turned out he took a bar out for himself before they gave me away anyway, right? So, um, as he's done, done that. <laughs> so I jumped into a taxi, but there was, I, I got a feeling. Um, I think you get a feeling. Got a feeling. I got a feeling and um, I got in the taxi and we, we drove away for his house and we drove for five minutes and I saw up in, in the mirror I saw a Polish jeep coming out at my back and um, I started to get a wee knot in my stomach and I thought, I don't, don't like you looking at it. And, but they just drove by me. And I, I thought, oh, well, they're, they're away by me. And the next thing I saw, it was only like a, it was like a busy Joe carriage when it was about one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. But there was these speed bumps um, to slow traffic down outside of school. And I saw what I thought was a drunk Indian crossing the road, and I'm thinking, if a road's stupid, you'll get around there. And he just stopped in front of the motor, the taxi, and the taxi stopped. Half a dozen Indians swarmed the motor, um, dragged me out the front, threw me in the back, took the driver out, one of the police got in the front and just drove away, and that was it. You know, I didn't, there was no crime scene, there was no question on the spot, there was no nothing, it was just in the back and away. Um, and I know now because I got the same feeling then as what I, I got when, when I discovered my brother had been killed. Um, but I was I was in shock. I was I, everything went into this big long tunnel and the colours all changed and I thought, fuck, man, this is I'm in trouble here. What was the procedure then when you went to the cop shop? <clears throat> um, the procedure was, you know, that you would think there would be a procedure, but there wasn't really one because. Because as it transpired, I'd bought the drugs after the polis. So we got to the police station and they they put me into this wee office at first and they're all looking and they're all laughing and they were all talking the, the language of theirs, Konkani and Goa. So they were all talking this language that I knew nothing about and laughing at me and saying 10 years and all that sort of a stuff. And um, something happened in me. I don't know what it was, but I thought, right, this is it, you know, you're, you're in trouble. Nothing you can do about it. Um, they took me and threw me in a in a, a dungeon. And when I went into the dungeon, there was two other characters in the dungeon. Um, there was no formal charging or, or anything like that. It was just, um, you know, pretty much, I didn't even know what was happening, you know what I mean? I didn't, I was not nobody came in and says, right, you're being charged with this. Um, threw me in the in the dungeon, took me back out and then later on that night they took me away down to where I stayed to search my flat. Did the finger the fingerprint you there take photos? At one point in the, the thing where they fingerprinted me and everything was done and it was all done fingerprint mm -hmm. and they took about 15 copies of this. So 15 sets of my fingerprints. Um, I, I tell a wee story in the book about the photos that the, they kept coming and taking me. I was in the dungeon for a week on a Polish remand. Um, but they kept coming and getting me and taking me out and so one day they could say, you're going for get your photos took. So I was like, right, fine. So it was like a chalkboard and they had my name and my, my number on the chalkboard. And I'm looking for the camera and there's no camera and they were like, right, come on. And they took me out to the police station into the wee town called Panjam and we went into a photo click shop. And they, they, in this show where people were getting passport photos and all that took me. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'd, a, I'd a, a beard by this point, man, and I looked as if I'd been fired out of a gun. And, um, and I'm thinking, 
I wonder what everybody thinks I've done. Because <laughs> <laughs> I read in a book as well, when you were going to court, they don't take you in like, it's not like here, the security car vans, they took you in the bus, <clears throat> public transport, is that right? James, I get brought back for court one time, uh, so <laughs> it was all mate, all right. So see when you were on the police, man, the police arrested you, and I was on the police, man, uh, before the before you get charged in the court, I get arrested in May, right? I get charged with the actual offence in November. So all that time, I was on a remand every two weeks, but the police were still in charge of me, in charge of me, although I was in the jail by this point. So when I was going up from my remands, it was the police that came and they put you in a jeep and they would take you and buy you a samosa or a wee glass of fresh lime soda. Um, and I looked forward to it, you know what I mean? It was, yes, I'm going out with the police and... Um, because they'd never, I smile, you know, you're a smile of yourself, and um, I, my nerves make me smile too, and, and they were like, don't, what you, you think it's funny? <laughs> <laughs> I just shake myself. No, I don't think it's funny, but this is the, the reaction. Um, so once I get, once I get charged officially, I'd been moved to another, a bigger jail, um, and if there, if there was 10 years or 20 years gone, you all went on the bus. So you can imagine that there's 20 prisoners on a bus and every prisoner's got two guards with them. So there's, the, the bus was like that and it was roasting and sweat stripping half you. But a couple of times I got took to court myself so they don't put the, the jail bus on for you. So you get a, a, you get down and you get a, a bus into the wee tune and a bus from one tune to the other tune where the court is. And then one time they actually hitchhiked back, man, and, and we were in the back of this big thing. It's called a Tata truck. Tata... Um, make big lorries out there, and the guy stops. So these two, um, two poor police. I look back now. You know what I mean? They were they, they're there. They've, they've get the finger out. I'm thinking they might even have been pocketing the two quid or whatever it was for the bus fare. You know. Um, so we're up on this big truck, man, and I'm sitting and I'm in the middle. Two police are there, and the driver's there, and um, he's talking at the top of me, and I can hear drugs getting mentioned and stuff like that. Um, and that, that, that experience there was a catalyst for me because I had prostate trouble and all that when I was in the jail. I had some health stuff going on. The food wasn't very clean. The water wasn't very clean. Um, were you honcuffed or anything when you were took it to court? I wasn't honcuffed once in a year. Did you never try and escape? The flip-flops might have tripped me up, James. That was, that was the thing. But, um, you know, there was... Escape was a possibility. If you, if you, I'd accepted it. I had, I'd accepted. This is your lot. Um, my lawyer had said to me, look, you're not going to get found guilty. You might be here a year, you might be here two years, but you'll definitely be acquitted at the end of your trial. So I, I didn't have any desire to run away because I'm thinking, a, 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 wee, a wee white Scottish guy, you know, and um, where am I going to go? See, when you were in there, did they, did you know try and bribe them and, or did they not ask for money to to get it? Um, no, but they took a bribe to bring you in a phone or they took a bribe to bring you in... You know, I, I, I was stoned every day. I was in the jail and the, the guards were bringing stuff in. You were not, you didn't try and fucking escape. <laughs> 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 was, did anybody speak English? Was there, anybody, um, was there an understanding between you and the screws? And, or some, of the, some of the screws weren't, they, they, their English wasn't very good because these guys were poor, you know what I mean? These, these screws in, in the jails were poor. They were probably on 60 or 70 quid a, a month wages. Um, some of them didn't have great English. They could say your name and say it, and they repeated your name and repeated your name. Something about my name that they liked saying. Because um, when you get put in a cell as well, there was 25, 25 in a cell? The, the first cell I went into, there was 25 people. So I walked in, and I'm petrified, you know what I mean? I've got two blankets and a pillow and a, a wee towel. Um, a metal, metal plate for a, like a tray and a metal cup. And this guy comes straight up to me and says, told me his name, shook my horn, and his English was pretty good. I told him who I was, and he says, it's okay, we know who you are, we've been waiting on you coming, because um, I'd been in the papers for, for the week previous. Um, he showed me my space on the flare, um, and he says to me, don't worry, as the cell empties, you'll move around and you'll get into a better space. So I was in a wee, a wee corner, Underneath a drip because it was the monsoon had started when I got arrested and the the the, the roof was leaking and um, but because it was really warm they were everybody was good to me you know what I mean I can't see there was no brutality or not, nothing harmed like. if people getting stabbed 
Sure. Um, I know other people might laugh, sure, but they've got guns and knives. No, no, listen, there was, there was um, in, the, in the wee jail, there was a couple of fights, but when I got moved to the bigger jail, one of the guys who got moved on my back, um, who I started off, I thought he was all right. I could yeah. end up pals with somebody for the Bombay Mafia. Aye, a guy called Ashback Bengri. Um, horrible, Some horrible, name that, horrible it? individual. Um, um, the guy was just he was a he was a murderer and he was an extortionist and um, and he just preyed on people. You know what I mean? He preyed on anybody he could get away with preying on. Um, his bag outside was extortion. So if there was coconut sellers selling coconuts for. Two bob, he would want a shilling, it, you know what I mean? So that's the kind of guy he was, and he had money. Um, but in there, he, he, he tried to make friends with the foreigners to see what he could get after them. Um, and I saw him manipulating. I had a Greek pal, a Greek boy came in a few weeks after me, and um, he was petrified, you know. He'd been gone back and forward to Goa for 30 years. He'd been doing business, as he called it, sending stuff back. And he couldn't believe it. Somebody had actually shopped him to the police, no, and he'd been arrested. And um, he would have done anything to get out. And he had a nice looking girlfriend who used to come up and um, this Ashback used to say, I like your girlfriend and all that. And, and then I, I used to see the two of them walking around the exercise yard together. Um, and I called this guy Mr Bean because he was a spin image of Mr Bean and he had his trousers up to the air and as he lost more weight, his trousers went further up and he had all the actions of um, Mr Bean. But he was getting parlier with this Ashback guy, um, my Greek pal. And... And I could see him getting frustrated and I could see the, just the pure anxiety in, the, in his face. And then one day I said to him, what's happening with you and him? And it turned out that this Ashback, he had his crew outside, had met with this Greek boy's girlfriend outside and she'd gave them money. And one of the times, we used to go to an international phone. Um, once a week they would let you go to a phone and you get 20 minutes using the phone. And that's when, if you were going to escape, that was the time to escape, you know what I mean? It was two old guys would, would take you and they'd flip-flops on as well, you know, and and if you had the means to escape, that was the time to do it. So, unknown to me, he'd got his girlfriend to give his guns money and then they hadn't helped him escape, you know what I mean? So he kept saying, when's it going to happen? He would tell him, Monday when you go to the phone, and he was just getting off frustrated, and then he was saying things like, they might hurt your girlfriend because no... They know where she stays and all that. And it was just pure shite the way he'd, he he just manipulated this guy's fear. Um and I ended up having to say, Gonna stop that with him, you know what I mean? Gonna gonna leave it out. Um he says he, f he felt like battering him and I says, Well, look, me and him will just leave the room again, you know, it's it's no no drama, we'll go to another room, you can get somebody else in. And what I watched him doing was just just like that transferred his stuff for the Greek guy to an Italian boy that was in me as man and it was horrible to watch because by this point we're in a room probably about this size but then there was nine years in it no and it was so you're you're living with people you're lying in the flare and um no sleeping beside guys and so you, you see everything it's not roasting it was sweltering man because I was there during the monsoon as well so um sometimes there would be power cuts and there was a fan above the room because I know it was all the it was all the new key news that you get the jail and how, how was the were they trying to help you here the British Embassy or there no try the so I I met so it was a big bone of contention for me James that I met the British Consul Service um, and there were three local people who who were the consular service out there um, and as the case went on it turned out that, that there had been a big web of conspiracy. Going back 10 years, corruption stuff, going back 10 years. Um, and I, I, I try to, my case was that these people here are all related to these people there. You no, know, so they might be working for the consular service, but they've got pals in the police. And it, it's just, it was just, because it's a wee place, you know what I mean? It wasn't a big place. Um, and I think if, if people are all called Fernandez or Gonzalez or Rodriguez, there's a good chance somewhere down the line that. One of them is going to be related to somebody else with the mm. same name. Um, so my my thing me was, you know, after I got bail, I, I was on to the I was writing to the prime minister. People writing, I, I got a Facebook group going and with thirteen thousand people in it. Um, and I'm saying my case isn't he, a British foreigner who's been arrested on a drug charge, 
my case is all the police who've arrested me have been arrested and something's not right here, you know what I mean? So how did they get all get to jail if you if you really want to try to buy it? <clears throat> what happened was I I'd been inside for about ten months and and you know, you smile at this as well, right? So there's the Israelis are there work with the police, right? In mm. Goa. Um so there was an Israeli guy and his name was Atala. He had a girlfriend, a Swedish girlfriend called Lucky Farmhouse, right? All this you can Google any of this, James, right? This is all Lucky it's all there for anybody. Right? Is that a cow? Well she was um, <laughs> she was Lucky Farmhouse was her name, right? So as it turns out she wasn't very nice because she was videoing this guy was working with a police who had protection after the home minister's son, right? Mm. So that's how deep this Weber Weber sh shit went, you know. Her and the her and the Italian, um, her and the Israeli guy Atala fell out. She then produced all this stuff that she'd been recording, and the house she'd been recording all these top police coming, them talking about, um, I'm going to give you hundred kilo of this, and I'm going to give you ten thousand pills, and I'm going to give you all this gear and smack and all that. Um, but them two fell out. Hell hath no fury. She loaded it up on YouTube. Um, all got took down off of YouTube. She put it back up on YouTube. And then I was in for about 10 months and it started to make the papers out there. And I'm like, fucking brilliant, man. All, all these guys who arrested me are all... Corrupt. All corrupt. Um, I knew they were corrupt, you know what I mean? I just, that's when it all fell into place for me. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I was just one of the patsies as well, you know what I mean? I didn't... At the time, I still thought the boy had bought the stuff off, he stuck me in. And it wasn't until... 10 months down the line that I realised that no, that it's, it's much deeper than this, you know, and, and I'm just a wee thing and a thing that they've been doing. But could you have still got a 10 stretch because you, you try to buy it as well? Well, what what actually happened was after 11 months, I got bail. They um, took a passport and that after you, everything? Well, they, they, they'd been quite fly. When I got arrested, they took me back to my flat and when they were there, they, they, they kind of robbed everything that was in the flat that was worth taking, but they took my passport and said I had it in my pocket. So that beca then became a, a, a bit of evidence. So my passport was way my case right from the very start. So I didn't have a passport right for when they got arrested in May. And I was having to sign on in the police station every every week at what first. Curfew? They cut the actual curfew, but I had to go to this right into their, you know, their den. So they've all been arrested. I'm having to go into the same place. It's other police that's there now, but... If they're all bent, then they're all bent anyway, you know what I mean? It's just the way it was. Having to go in there every Monday and, and sign on. Um, was there people coming on visiting you? Were there like visitors? Aye. Um, when I was inside, my wee ma came out to visit me with my boy. Um, they would get four visits, and I'm smiling because they, they were they were good visits, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm a Selic fan, and my ma brought her 75 Selic jerseys, and the full jails are running about doing that, and... Um, so that was, that was great. They were all asking me for a green T-shirt. <laughs> so it's not a green T-shirt. I said, don't you? I said, okay, what it is. Um, but the, and at the end, so after four, they were only there for two weeks, four visits we got, and, and I was away up there. I went back to the cell. I knew I wasn't going to see them for I didn't know how long. And there was a guy, Mario Fernandez, who'd murdered his girlfriend, um, which is common out there. Um, oh, rapists and murderers. Mix freely with you know, woman murderers and all that. They mix freely with everybody else. Um, this guy Mario was saying to me, "Oh, it's a problem, James Baba." I know, and I'm like, oh, "Fucking my man, my boy." And I don't take tension. I'll sort it out. I'm like, "All right, this will be good." So he's went away and he's come back and he says, "Right, just get yourself a a hospital appointment for Tuesday." I'm like, "How did he do that?" He's like, "Go and see the doctor in the morning." So I went and saw the doctor. Told him I had to go on about the prostate. Um, and they, they they arranged the appointment for the Tuesday and I was able to tell my ma that I was going to be at this hospital on the Tuesday so my ma came back and they let us have a picnic in the garden and all that man and it was it was really nice so my last time I saw my man my boy was not them leaving me in a shite hole you know what I mean it was them leaving me in this garden and a a good memory. Uh, it was a good. It, it was good for them. It was better for me as well, obviously. But so long did you keep in India for three years? Four years in total. I was a year in prison and then three years going through the trial. And that's so. What, what was the outcome of the trial then? After the three years with the case, how was it? Were you no know, shaking yourself that they were going to take you back in? As the time went on, um, I was sigh because 
no, I was, I was having to rely on people uh, here supporting me, but I was also ducking and diving during the three years to... Still? Aye. So if you get caught, you're lifered? Aye. Well, probably right back into the same same thing again. Same but, scenario? Aye. What were you doing when you get on remand, when you were out for? Um, look, I, I, I was, a lot of the time was, it was all right, you know, spent on the beach or kind of hanging about with kind of older guys that I wouldn't have, you know, got English Tories and all that that thought Maggie Thatcher was all right. And, um, but I spent a lot of time, and I don't like the term self medicating, but I spent a lot of time self medicating. You've done, you done a lot of reading, did you know? Because I hear you speak about um, your cartol a lot. And... I did, because that's the thing, you know. Now I'm in recovery, right? And I know that spirituality is a big part of that. Um, India is a place for spirituality as well. Absolutely. But man, don't forget right? a sentence. And... Do you know, James, I, I actually I, I made a petition to the court and asked for time to travel, and they gave me five weeks and I went away up into the Himalayas man and it was fucking you know is that all you wrote your book some bits I started writing it when I was on the train going up into started the, the introduction I started writing and I've still got the stuff in the house where I was writing um, be paying in the jail you know what I mean and everybody you know, wanted to know if they were in the book and all that and, and that Ashback was always looking at the tab of me because I couldn't write about him you know what I mean he was because um, he's dead now. He get murdered. He did. He get murdered. Aye, and it's, you know I don't. In the jail. He got murdered in the jail in two thousand and sixteen. Um, so no long ago. No long ago. No, and do you know I, I find it because I, I I kind of I, I made a contrast and compare thing with two boys I was in. Me one was a guy called Yuki Marita, and he was a Japanese boy, and he was so altruistic. You know what I mean? He was he would want to clean your plate, and he would he would want to get everybody out the cell, and he wanted to clean it and. Um, a lovely, lovely guy, but he was mixed up, you know, and his head was scrambled. <clears throat> when I got out, he then won his case and he got out. And um, he came down to see me in the place I was staying and um, I, I was able to lend him some money and it wasn't much money, you know, and he went away and then he phoned me, I want to give you the money back. So he came down to see me and he was riddled with smack, you know, and, and I looked after him for a few days and managed to get him a wee bit better. And, um, and he told me I, I'm going away. Um, I'll see you when I come back. And um, so he'd been released in the June 2010. And in November 2010, he got caught in Bali with six kilo and get 18 year. I was like, what the fuck happened there? You know what I mean? You get found not guilty. And in his head, he still thought it was a good idea. To... And he'd went for um, India to Bali and he was going to Thailand and, and then Australia. Now, I don't know if his final destination was Australia, but... Flying through Bali and then Thailand with six kilo in your... And then Australia, was he trying to make money to get Australia? Was he going to he take trying to get to Australia? Australia that, because that's where the big bucks were for what he had. Aye, because it's expensive for drugs Aye. in Australia because obviously Australia. they need to get it there. Aye, and I googled him, somebody asked me about him, and so he got 18 years in Bali. Um, and one of my pals, a boy from Ireland, was in Bali and he went to visit him and took him fags and gave him money and all that. Um, and I googled him probably about 18 months ago. And he, he went and he hung himself, man. And I found out on a Google search that my mate had hung himself in Bali. And, and it, it broke my heart. But at the same time, I found out this other bastard had been murdered <laughs> in the jail. And I thought, look, well, you know. The Bombay Mafia. Aye. He, he got what when you were out for out. your three year on bail, was it, it took three years for it to go to court? No. Um, I appeared in court every two weeks, every four weeks. I appeared in court a hundred times during that, that period. Um, you would go to court, the prosecutor wasn't there, they would give you another date. You would go back up, the judge wasn't there, they would give you another date. The witness hadn't turned up. See here, the witness doesn't turn up at court, then he's, they send for him, didn't they? You know, and they're there, it was, um, the witness didn't turn up three times in a row, and you know, I had to be to court for two months, or I'd been up and down, you know, and just get mere dates. And, um, you know, and sometimes my legal team didn't bother turning up as well, and you know, and I would phone them and say, will I come to court? Oh, no, come, definitely come. And you'd get there and the court was known. And part of the time, it was a two-hour journey to get to court, a two-hour journey back, you know what I mean? So, was, um, so that wore me down a wee bit. Uh, tired you? Tired me. No, 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 you were going to get him on though. Aye, that was always the thing. Was there going to be an outcome? Did you know you were only getting a big sentence or did you, <clears throat> my lawyer you worried about it? My lawyer had always says to me, like, don't worry, you'll be acquitted at the end of the trial. But so how were you going to get acquitted? How was the... Um, lack of evidence, corruption. What was it? As it turns out, when they when they make the charge sheet, right? So this is the way it all works, isn't it? You know, 
the lawyer, the police, the judge, the lot of them, they're all, they're all Rodriguez, Fernandez, or, mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So there's a relationship between them all. My lawyer first got brought to me with the police who arrested me. He says to me, look, don't worry, you've been here for 12 months, 18 months, or something like that, but you'll get out. Um, this police was always saying to me, don't worry, I'm going to make a weak case against you. So it's all about... Who it's you all know? About, eh? Who you know? So you uh, obviously uh, had an in? So I, I had a good lawyer, right? And what this lawyer says to me was, don't worry, we haven't lost a foreigner yet. And I says to him, I don't want you to be sitting here next year and saying, don't worry, we've only lost one foreigner so far, you know what I mean? And Because that's it doesn't matter what he tells you. You're always thinking, and see here, you instruct your lawyer, earlier you pay the money and... Try and get a good... And thing just, here. you know, and, and this guy, if, and there was an Israeli guy just before me who had him, had my lawyer, sacked him, took, brought a hotshot down for Bombay and paid a lot of money for him and got 10 years because the hotshot was coming out of state it's like bringing a lawyer up for England to his hot shot down there to try and deal with something in the high court up here, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Derek Ogg and Donald Finley have got that covered up here. Right. And, um, did you get, so it, you knew you were only getting a 10 year, so you, when did you eventually get a not guilty or a... I, I eventually, um, I, they, they call it acquitted there, there. I went to court on the, was it the 23rd twenty third of April 2013. Um and I'd, there was a couple of people there. We went in the morning and they told us to come back early afternoon. We went back in the afternoon. They told us to come back at five o'clock. And we went back at five o'clock. The court was empty. And then um, this court clerk came out and he says to me, come into the, so I went into the judge's chambers and the judge was sitting there and and he was reading the papers. And um, there was one of my lawyer's understudies was there and the prosecutor was there. And I'm standing and I'm feeling that they knew, you know what I mean? I was absolutely shaking from my toes right up and... Because um, even though I was 100% sure I was going to be found not guilty, there's still a bit of uncertainty. Um, and he said something, and she stood up, shook my hand and said, well done. And that was that, just a big fucking anticlimax to the full thing, because you know, I, was, I wanted my day in court, I wanted to be told to walk out the door of the court, and mm. you know, and he, he just gave me a nod like that, and that was me. There you go. Did All you right. get your passport back that day? No. Um... I didn't get a, I didn't get my passport. I had to actually get a, there was a three month appeal period, basically. So the three month appeal period was to allow the prosecution to decide whether they were going to appeal my case. So I eventually got a, a passport in the, the, the July. Um, so I'd been acquitted in April and I eventually got my passport near the end of July. Did you come home straight away? As soon as I got there, and it was just a one, you know, the passport you're allowed, it's a white one, and you're only allowed one journey with it. How bad were you on the drugs then, before you came home? Um, I, I was I was using quite a lot of Valium, um, you buy it at the chemist. I was, Is that because they're nerves? Because I know your brother got murdered as well. Um, when did he get murdered, James? When? Aye. 2004. When you were travelling? Were you travelling at the time? No, I was... Uh, I, I was a drug worker working with the social work department when Martin was killed. Um, I'd got after drinking in 2001, um, went back to college, done a bit of counselling, and then I got a good job in residential social work with, with children and families. And I changed my life about, you know what I mean? I had to stop drinking, I stopped taking drugs, um, and life was all right. Um, 2004, he was murdered. I stayed in social work. Martin was murdered in June. I stayed in social work until the next April. And then I left to go back to the building trade. Um, and then when I when I was back in the building trade, I started snorting the gear again and, and all that stuff. And, and my life just fell apart. Um, and that's, I ended up travelling and went back to India. So that's obviously affected you as well, which... Massive, massive thing, but you know what, I can... Uh, I, I wore a victim's badge because of my dad, my dad, my dad, poor me. Um, you know, it did affect me, and I, I wouldn't, you know, there's, everybody's got a backstory, and a bit of my backstory to that is what we've spoke about. Um, and my dad dying was a big part of that. Um, but when my brother died, 
I let that define me, you know what I mean? I let my brother's been murdered and poor me and about so it. gives you an excuse to hit it hard again. Absolutely, man. Going, fuck man. it, leave your job. No. Stop caring about yourself. Stop caring about yourself and all the people who cared about you, pushing them away and, um, you know, and, that, and that's exactly what I've done, James. I. But everything you've done, Faye, then, and everything that's affected you has led us to where you're the new. Aye. Your book, Clean Again, a year cleaner again, so congratulations Thanks for very that, much mate. for that. Um, it takes a lot of bottle to create change and make changes but you've you've made them before and you've got to understand how good it is you feel when you're off it because I've relapsed on numerous occasions and I preach when I'm off it and, and I say it's a, the way forward and it is because for me it is because Aye. when you're off it you do feel good life is good your, your energy is focused on yourself and doing and good things and it's easy to rip the whole ceiling down again so when you eventually come back from India you started your book in India and the Himalayas Aye. And then you come back. When did you get yourself off everything? When you come back? Um. So when when I came back, I was, you know, I yeah, I was. Yeah, because you all the news in that, James, weren't you? When I came back, I the the the, the evening times. A guy called David Lee could kind of covered my story, and he was really fair with it. Um, BBC Scotland done a couple of wee things as well, and they they were kind of they were fair with it as well, you know, because they didn't know any any of the backstory. You know what I mean? They just knew what I was telling them. And I wasn't able to be 100% honest when I was in India. Because um, you've still got a case pending. Because I've still got a case pending, you know. But, no, the I, I, I wasn't guilty. Of, I was guilty of something, you know. And, I, and well, I've right, never, you're I've trying never, to buy two and a half kilos, so you're guilty of the Absolutely, away. you know. And I've never denied that. But instead of them charging me, we've been in this taxi and having bought this stuff, they then say that I was going to a bus stop, going to meet a guy. And I couldn't make any sense of that. But as a, when they all got arrested, it all made perfect sense because... The people who arrested me were the people who had bought the stuff off you through a third party and, and they were just taking themselves out of the equation. Um, but also, the fact that they'd made up this big story of me being in a place I'd never been in and witnesses try to tell a big giant lie, then it, it made their case pretty flimsy, you know what Why I mean? Why would they lie anyway if they caught you, do you know what I mean? See if, they, see if there was no corruption with it, would you have got a 10? Um, or would you have got a sentence... A bigger sentence than the, the year remand that you've done? I think if I'd been found guilty, I would have got a 10, but I was in with a, an Italian boy, exact same story as mine. His charge sheet was mine, except for his name, his age, different place, exact same. Two Russian guys, exact same. Um, anybody for before, exact same. So the policy arresting me had been at, at it for 10 years. What were they doing, setting people up, taking their gear off from and getting a sentence? Did they get money for it? No, they, <laughs> what, it's uh, mental way here, that's right. Mm -hmm. So any drugs that are seized, they're the ones gave the drugs to dispose of. Now, come on. You know what I mean? It's, mm. And these are the guys who's getting £100 a month wages. You're getting them... So what they, what, what they were doing was, a poor Indian guy brings down 100 kilo for the mountains, right? He's got somebody to meet. The guy who's got to meet are working with the police. They've no regard for anybody anyway, right? So they just set him up. The police arrest him with 100 kilo. He then faces 10 years in the jail that he's going to get anyway because he's a poor Indian. But they don't charge him with 100 kilo. They charge him with two and steal 98 of them. Because mm -hmm. the two's still going to get your 10. Two's going to get my 10. They're going to have a guy who's been caught all the papers with two kilo. They've got another 98 to get you the, the local boys to sell, to get you the Israelis to sell, um, or to sell to guys like me, you know, because that wasn't the first time I'd bought dope of them. <laughs> How much was it for a kilo of hash over there? Um, it's about 600 quid. Is it? Mm -hmm. That's fucking quite dear, is it? No, I thought it would have been cheaper for you. Well, in Goa, if you go up into the mountains, I think you can get it for... Mm -hmm. for, for but it's... it's the, the bottoms fell out of the world the economy yeah, yeah, you expect all the corruption all there because the wages are slim Aye. so they were just setting everybody up taking the gear off them and then getting people sentenced Aye. so obviously you've had a bit of pull in there as well to, to get you out that court case and to get you home free um, I, I, what I had was a belief that you know because again when it comes down to the your argument part you don't you have not got to prove it and they've got to prove it and the, the mental way it works so see the policeman in charge mm. He tells the story. Here's what happened, right? The other ten police are there. They say, aye, he's telling the truth. And then they bring an independent guy to say he was there when the arrest happened. Now, the independent guy wasn't there when the arrest happened because the arrest didn't actually happen the way they're saying it happened. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the court case, he's been coached into the evidence he's got to give, but the hotshot lawyer 
who's done this a thousand times, he knows the questions to ask him to trip him up. So. Is there a category with drugs or there? Obviously, hash used to be a, C, uh, a class C here, and now I think he moved it to a B. Um, Is there categories like an A, B, C? They've got different categories. I'm not too sure what they are, but the the... There's different, um, like for, for powder stuff, they wouldn't call it a class A, but a, a kind of powder, sentences. powder stuff would get you the same kind of sentence, but for, for less of it, you know what I mean? It was to be, I think, well, the, the, I've got a Russian pal, again, he got caught with 200 grams of MDMA, 10 grams of MDMA gets you 10 years, so they charged him with 20 and stole 180 grams of stuff happened. So basically they're just... Jailing right. people, putting some back and then taking your arrest. Right. James, that boy got arrested before me in 2009 and his case hasn't he finished yet. He's still in the jail? No, he got bail and he sells books on the beach and he's turned himself into a bit of a guru, but mm -hmm. um, he doesn't want to go back to Putin's Russia, so he's... See, when you come back, were you still dabbling with drugs then? Aye, I was, aye. For a few years. Was that your nerves or were you um, locked up in a, a cell with I, a few I don't, people? I don't know if it was my nerves, it just I was, they obviously wasn't comfortable in myself, you know what I mean? And... Um, I can. I, I was still sniffing stuff, and I was, you know, taking tablets, and um, and I smoked dope every day because I didn't think dope was, you know, affected me at all. So what made you want to get off it all then? What made you the change last year? Um, I took somebody close to me to a CA meeting, and I sat at the CA meeting and. Um, cause I went to A when I get after drink. Cause Andy McLaren spoke about you. Gandhi actually spoke. about Andy took me to my first A meeting well, two weeks ago. Andy aye. actually says I've got aye. a pal James Dora. I said fucking hell, he's just aye. actually sent me his book. Aye, good, good for him, man. Aye. Aye. Andy's a great guy. Aye. Shout out to Andy boy. Aye, Andy's a he great took guy. me to my first A meeting. Mm -hmm. So me and him done the circuit for a wee while one year, which was great. But a year ago, I took somebody close to me to a meeting. Um, the guy chairing is the guy who's my sponsor today and I heard him talking and, and when I'd been in India he used to send me wee messages saying there's a seat for you at the Saturday Night Fever with your name on it, no? And, um, and we used to have a laugh about it. So I went to Saturday Night Fever. He chaired and he spoke about the illness, you know, and he spoke about control and he spoke about choice and being powerless there, control and choice. And I thought, fuck, that's me. Um, makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely, aye. It, make, it makes for me. It just went the, another piece in the jigsaw fell into place. And the lassie who shared that night, she broke the twelve steps down. And I thought, I am. I could do that. So, you no. Know, for that day to this, I, I, I followed the suggestions that you get in there. I joined a group. I got a sponsor. I went through the program. I help others. I do all this stuff. And the the idea that smoking dope or having a line of coke or anything like that would be a good idea left me um, you know and I know it's only a daily thing but I'm doing all the right stuff so you're doing all the right things you're up speaking at the schools today you're going out of shots tonight you speak in there Aye. you're doing big things you've wrote your book when did you finish the book James? Um, the book's actually turned into two in the second part oh, going, the you're... second part's Aye. out in May James as well right so um, I sent it to an editor because that was one of the things right that I wrote that and it went into a file and it lay there and I'd done nothing with it and I would, if I met you, I'd be saying, no, I've wrote a book. And you'd say, how can I get it? And I'm saying, well, you can't really get it because mm. I've done nothing. Is that because you were still on the, the madness? Absolutely, aye. Absolutely. Um, and when I... So I've stopped drinking and then I've stopped taking prescribed medication and then I've stopped taking gear and I was holding on to the puff. You know, it's only a bit of dope. Um, you make excuses for it, don't you? Aye, absolutely. You know, it's, it's just, what hems it done? Aye. You've had to do it every year for the last 30, you know, there's something mm -hmm. going on there. Um, and when I stopped smoking dope, I started to see in high definition and I started to see that you've got a story there, don't st st stop telling people you've wrote a book, you know, to actually do something with it. And I done a crowdfund last year um, to get it edited properly. Um, and the support I got for that was, was amazing. You know, I got two and a half grand and by the time they took their wee bit, there was 2,300 quid. Um, so that allowed me to get it edited properly. But when I sent it to the guys, like, look, you've got two books there. Um, turn that into two, you know what I mean? Um, so that's what we've done. That's the first one. I brought it out in December. Um, and how can people get your book, James? People can get my book off my website, which is um, James www.jamesjitoner.co.uk um, or they can buy it off Amazon. Um, so people have been buying it both. I, you know, I don't really care how people buy it, but um, to get my story out there is a thing. And I'm really hoping that I can get the second one into 
Waterstones and W. H. Smith. Brad Welsh. I spoke to Brad after he'd been on here. Brad's a pal. Brad's I mean, a great guy as well. Absolutely, Love man. Brad. And you know, and Brad, Brad's the you can change, and mm -hmm. you know, he's a million mile an hour. And, um, so he messaged me, and he's like, I didn't fucking didn't know you'd a book it, and, and I, so I was talking about it. She's like, here's what you should be doing. Um, so my my marketing strategy is going to be different with the second one. Um, because it's all been a big learning curve for of me. Course, you know, everything's, and, and everything's trial and error, James. Yeah, and you've yeah. got your first book out, you've done it, you've got yourself clean, you're getting the second book out. Yeah. For anybody wanting to change, what message would you have from her if they were struggling themselves? Um, no, for me, I date with uh, Cocaine Anonymous is the one for me. If you're, if you're struggling, talk to somebody, you know, that's that's the start, trying to reach out. Somebody will always be there. Um, if you think you've got a problem with, with drink or drugs, and the problem being that once you start, you can't stop. And when you manage to stop, you can't stay stopped. Um, I believe in the 12 steps. No, I believe in the universe. So the higher power thing for me was dead easy. Um, clearing all that stuff, all the stuff about my dad, all the stuff about my brother, all the shit I'd done through my life. Um, trying to make the amends for that. Um, you know, and... And actually, see all the stuff that I read about Buddha and Eckhart Tolle and all the spirituality stuff, actually putting that into practice at the same time as understanding you've got an illness. Because yeah. a lot of people who suffer don't know what it is they suffer for, you know what I mean? They think they drink too much or they think they take too much something. Um, she was trying to identify where you're going wrong a lot. A ah, lot you know, and that's just a symptom, isn't it? The, mm -hmm. the, what you do is the symptom for how you feel. We're scared, we're... We're Absolutely, too, we're too scared to admit we've got problems. A lot of people are in denial, and that's fine. But you've just got to be honest with yourself as much as you can be, and and, right. and look at where you want to change and how you can improve your life. It's just, people have got too much pride to admit they've got whether it's on the weed or the hash or the Valium or the Charlie or the Brown or mm -hmm. whatever it is. If you're doing that and it's destroying your life and you're waking up and you're no miserable, you don't need to live there. You can wake up and actually be happy. Right. I'm a positive guy. I have my moments. I've right. had a house. Like I say, I've had my my relapses, but I get back on and when I'm on the track, I do big things and you can wake up happy and it's all down to you as an individual if you want to change and just educate yourself, open up, Aye. set your power, look up for a meeting and if you're embarrassed to go to a local meeting, go to one further away then where you might not Aye. know anybody and you can, you don't need to say anything, you can just listen. Absolutely. And you, once you realise you're not alone and you understand that there's people out there that's fucked up just as much as me then you actually learn and grow as a person and realise that the people who actually take the steps to improve their life are the strongest people that I've ever met mm. because they're no, they're no living in fear that they're no good enough or they don't think they're good enough yeah, so absolutely. for anybody to take these steps you've got to take your heart after them and mm. guys like yourself will come on and tell your story and write your book and change your life especially when in India you could have we're on this mark all there and, and stuck in a I, fucking I, I saw it, James. Stuck you know, in a house I, I, and I, I, never get I out. I saw it, I saw it. But you've done it, James. And to come on today and tell your story, I really appreciate that. And thanks for the book. Thanks for uh, having me. Aye, definitely. And Magic. all the best for the future. And for anybody getting the book, get involved, read it. It's actually brilliant, man. The story's phenomenal. Um, but thanks a lot, James. Thank you, man. Brilliant. Day, brother. James, Thank brilliant. You. Thanks very much. AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. They offer services from full event planning and management right down to the standalone venue dressing. AM events strive for 100% customer satisfaction every time from email updates and how about the planning is going, managing the day of the event. They will support you the whole way through. So for more information to make a booking, pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Their phone number is 0141 237 3020. So pop along, or else their social media pages are on Facebook AM Events and also Instagram at amevents.glasgow.